strong and mighty deliverer. And the Lord is able to save us. The Lord is able to make us do great things. Um, today's message is um, entitled Imperfect Faith. And this is a series of messages that we have been doing. For those of you who feel like, okay, we have enough of the judges. You cannot really escape the judges, right? In the last few months, for those of you who are from this congregation, of course, I'm just going to give you a background from, for, for the sake of our visitors. We have been doing a series of messages from the book of Judges. And from there, we have discovered that most of these leaders that the Lord has appointed to lead these people are actually flawed, sinful, imperfect. And that's why that's the title of our series. It's called Imperfect Judges. And, and after going through the series, do you agree? brothers and sisters, that, that these people are not really perfect, right? That it doesn't really matter of your status. It's how God chooses you and how God could use you. The rest of the work belongs to God, really. A lot of times you don't want to serve God because they feel like, oh, I'm not really holy yet. I'm not really perfect yet. Well, brother and sister, if you're waiting for yourself to be perfect, you will never be used by God at all because it's not, it ain't gonna happen. It ain't gonna happen in your lifetime. It will only happen when you are fully with God. Is there anyone here who could claim that he, is, he has reached a certain level of perfection already, he or she? Could you raise your hand? Okay, no one. Not even, I'm, 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 I was raising my hand, yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. So that, that's how it is. Now the thing is, like when we concluded the book of Judges, we said that four of the judges actually landed in Hebrews' hall of faith. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're like, what? Why? Why were they included in the list? And so in order for us to investigate further, we spent like, what, five weeks now exploring Hebrews chapter 11. And we said, let's look at what Hebrews is all about. Not the entire lot. The rest of the church is actually doing a series from Hebrews chapter 1 onwards. But for me as your pastor, I just feel like we need to make a connection between what we have learned from the book of Judges and, of course, what was the input given by the writer of Hebrews. Why did he say that after we bashed all the judges and say, oh, these people are like really immoral and flawed and, and they couldn't do, couldn't do anything better? And lo and behold, in the book of Hebrews, he says, oh, they're part of God's faithful people. Why? And so said, let's look at the, the, the lenses of the Hebrews. We did a series called Heroes of Faith based on Hebrews 11. And again, I would play like a broken record. When you say Hebrews, when you look at the Bible and you say, okay, let us study the book of Hebrews, what's the theme? Basically, Jesus is greater. Can we say that line there? Jesus is greater. Again, one, two, three, go. Jesus. I, I realized this. I was at the Peace Fellowship yesterday, and in terms of the Chinese churches, and I've observed this, they would flash a Bible verse, right? And then they will recite it together, like, no, 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 you know, like, and I was like, and, and that's with much conviction. And I reckon that's part, if that is part of our culture, then let's do this, right? You know, like, when, 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 when we read together, we, we give that full, um, you know, like, buy-in or belief into what. So, um, Hebrews, Jesus is basically greater, and we're, we're going to we're, keep that in mind as, as we make the point later. So, that's it. Now, again, according to P. and Stewart, what was the context of Hebrews? says, try to put yourself in the shoes of the Jews, the Jewish people who believed in Jesus. They're very much deep in the Old Testament, right? Then all of a sudden, they put their trust in Jesus. Put yourself in their shoes, who so long ago, they put their trust in Christ, believing that at long last, the fulfillment of their messianic hopes had come only to have suffering and sin continue long after they have first believed. Let me ask you this question. Who are Christians here? Who are followers of Jesus here? Could you please raise your hand? Very good, right? As you confess to be a follower of Jesus Christ, did you experience more suffering than where, when you were not a Christian? I think that's the question. I'm not going to ask you to, to declare that individually. Just think about it. Did your life become better? Did your life become more easy did you not suffer anymore and a lot of times you know when you attend evangelical meetings and people challenging you to follow jesus a lot of them are promising you a very good life 
But then lo and behold, you realize that, you know what, whoa, it's not that simple. It's not that perfect, you know? The calling to become a Christian is not like calling you to a life with a bed of roses. Actually, underneath those roses are what? Thorns, right? You know, <laughs> just like, oh, you got you there, you know, like. It's not a life of a bed of roses, but it's a life of suffering. But what's the difference? What's the difference when a person who doesn't have faith in Jesus Christ suffer and a person who, okay, you all raise your hand, right? Oh, I'm a Christian. What's the difference when you experience suffering? Between someone who doesn't know God and someone who knows Jesus, what's our difference? Can you just give me some words there from, from, from the audience? What? Okay, there's hope. Okay, there's faith, yeah. What else? There's peace. Yeah, I, I reckon that that's really important. For me, it's like in the midst of the storm, there's that peace in your heart. What else? And we're not denying suffering, okay? I want this congregation to know that even if you are a believer in Christ, you will still suffer. But the guarantee there is that you have hope. You're not defeated. You're not going to tail spin into depression. It's like, whoa, I'm so alone and I'm all by myself. I'm not going to sing the song. <laughs> Although it's nice, right? You know, they, they always sing that in Idol, American Idol or whatever. Um, you know, because you know that you're not alone. You know that there's someone for you. There is always hope. Now, the, the problem with the Hebrew people is that they feel like, oh no, what has happened now? We're putting our trust in Jesus Christ and yet, you know, like we are suffering. And so the, 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 the writer of the Hebrews is saying, no, Jesus is better. You didn't, you didn't make the wrong decision, okay? So again, the, the Hebrews chapter 11 is not just about, you know, the list of people in the hall of faith. Basically, it defines what faith is. We defined this already. For those of you who know Hebrews 11.1, 1, in your own biblical translation, can we recite that memory verse together? One, two, three, go. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe next time we're going to have a quiz, right? <laughs> what is faith? And he didn't just mem um, give, us, gave a, give us a definition of faith. He also lists a myriad of people who are examples of faithfulness. Do you get that? And that's what we have been studying all along in the last four weeks. Pastor David began with the primordial faith, you know, like the faith of Abel, of Enoch, and Noah. And then we picked it up from the faith of Abraham. Again, if you are listening to the sermon, what kind of faith did Abraham possess? And this is like, what, the fourth week that I'm showing this picture and the fourth week that I'm reiterating. What kind of faith? Describe it. Shout it out. Come on. This is assessment now, right? <laughs> assessment time. What kind of faith? What? Pioneering faith? Yeah? Is, is, did I hear it correctly? Pioneering faith because God dealt with him. No, no background there whatsoever from a different country. Asked to, he was asked to go to a, a different land. Okay, it's a pioneering faith. What else? Huh? Um, obedient. Yeah, it's an obedient faith. It's a faith that acted upon, um, you know, the will of God. So it's, it's like, okay, I'm just going to obey. It's an, obedient, it's an obedient faith. What about the second generation of, um, you know, like followers of God? So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and Joseph, what kind of faith did they possess? The title of the message here is Generational Faith, right? That's why, like, pioneering faith there, like, Jane, make that connection. Come on. Look at the picture. Yeah, yeah. It's a vision, right? It's a faith that is able to see through the future. It's a faith that is able to bless because they were told. They haven't experienced it fully, but they were told by their forefathers, and they're living it out, and they can see. You know, who are, who are parents here? Could you please raise your hand? You know, can you pronounce blessings to your children if you do not see any bright future ahead? 
You know, if you do not have that, can you just say, oh, you know, well, yeah, it's, it's just going to be fine. No. So that's, that's where these patriarchs are coming from. It's a visionary faith. It's a faith that looks into the future. What about Moses? What about Moses? Huh? It's a saving faith. It's a saving faith, redeeming faith. A Pharaoh, you know, like someone who lived in luxury in the, the house of the Pharaoh, identifying with the people of God, using himself as an agent of God to deliver the people out of Egypt. Salvific faith, okay? Technical. Salvific or a faith that is able to save. So today, it's about imperfect faith of the judges. Now, the first two verses talked about how the people of Israel marched down to Jericho. Do you remember that story? Kids from Sunday school, Blaze, you're doing your OT series this year, so you'll probably, you have probably gone beyond the, the conquest, right? So it starts with people going around Jericho, you know, praising God, and then the walls came tumbling down. There was a prostitute there. What's the name of the prostitute? Rahab, okay, who was saved because she believed. She believed that, you know, at the time when the conquest is happening, they were hearing rumors. The, God, the Israelites are coming down and they're following their God. She has a different God. But then Rahab felt that, you know what? I do want to subscribe to their God. I want to follow their God. She, she gave very much hospitality and cooperation to the spies. And therefore, she was saved from, from that conquest. That's it. Let's read Hebrews 11.32 now. One, two, three, go. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all of the prophets. So after writing so long, you know, recalling the stories of, um, you know, like Abel, of Enoch, of Noah, and Abraham, and all the patriarchs, the writer finally says, oh, this chapter is too long, right? And he's saying, how much more do I need to say, you know, to convince you that these people have followed God in faith? Basically, that's what he's saying. But our question here is this. Why the inclusion of these four, these four guys, right? Do they exemplify a life of faith? And I'm going back again to the series of messages that we did. Do you think they deserve to be there? Who says yes? Who says no? Who says, I don't really know, <laughs> Right? They were included side by side with King David and the prophet Samuel and all the prophets. Amazing, right? Now, just to, re to give you a review of the, the, the characteristics of these people, right? This is what Hebrews 11.33 onwards says. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned into strength. They became strong in battle and put on the whole armies to flight. Now, let's, let's pause for this for a while, right? Does this passage refer to the people that we have just mentioned previously? Okay. Do they qualify among these ones? Next slide there. Let's, let's, let's go through this one. one. Bible Knowledge 101. Um, name some Old Testament characters who overthrew kingdoms. Who's probably included in the previous list? Or maybe someone that you know. Anyone? Okay, so Gideon threw over, overthrew the Midianites. So like most likely the judges who fought. What else? Yeah, most of them like did that. You know, they, they overthrew. And according to biblical scholars, they probably ruled with justice, okay? So this probably refers to the ju judges. But those overthrowing kingdoms would most likely be kings, right? Now, um, who shut the mouths of lions? Huh? The angel, <laughs> right? So which Bible story is related to that? Daniel, okay, Daniel and the lions then, okay. What about quench the flames of fire? Hmm. Okay. The fiery furnace, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then the fourth man looks like the son of God. Very good. Okay. Um, and who escaped death by the edge of the sword? 
Hmm? Could be could be David, you know, when he's running after away Saul. Could be Elijah, you know, like after the battle at Mount Carmel. Okay. Now the key key point here is like, okay, we're not looking for accuracy here. Okay, but that's the point there. These people have done great and mighty exploits because of their outstanding faith in God. Right? But looking back at the judges, they're never exemplary in their behavior. Gideon pleased God. Right? Jephthah sacrificed his daughter. Barak asked an elderly prophetess to join him in the battle before he goes. And then, of course, Samson violated all the rules. Right? But they were found faithful nonetheless okay are you getting this brothers and sisters right if we measure their faithfulness based on the present day christian standard probably you will judge them harshly you would probably say oh what i mean when people don't come to church you judge them right away oh you're not coming to church or you're not joining the bible study of course i'm not asking you not to join the bible study or coming to church or like someone committed a mistake you know, we judge them right away. But look at this, right? These people were found faithful. Why? Because this is what Hebrews says. Can we read that highlighted line together? One, two, three, go. Weak. Their weakness was turned into strength. Their weaknesses, actually, should be weaknesses were turned into strength. Right? Are you okay? Are you with me? Are you with me? That is the reason why they qualified. Because it is the work of God. It's never their work anyway. Now, why am I saying this to you, Central? I think for so long, a lot of you were paralyzed. A lot of you didn't want to get involved. Or some of you probably have legitimate reasons. Maybe you were overtired. But in this church, I don't want us to act as if we're holier than anyone else. In this church, we're all sinners before God. Can I have an amen for that? And whether you're young or whether you're old, whether you've been a Christian for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, doesn't make you any better than any one of us. Even Pastor John. That's why I said we. Okay? Because a lot of times, you know, the condemnation begins here. You know, the way you look the way you make comments, the way we treat each other. If God is able to give much grace to these very flawed people, how much more are we? You know, because we're all weak anyway, right? Because God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. I'm not saying that you remain weak. I'm not saying that you remain stunted in your growth. As a, as a believer in God, I want you to grow. I want you to grow stronger. But no one is better than anyone else. Do you get that? Are you picking it up? And it's about God's strength being made perfect um, through our weaknesses. Now, some women receive their loved ones back and forth from the death. Um, do you remember the story? Death? Elisha? Okay, Elisha. That's very good. Now, but faith is not all, okay, if I believe in God, I'm going to do a lot of great and mighty things, you know? A lot of great and mighty things because that's an example set in the life of the judges, in the life of David. Because of God's empowerment in their life, even in their weaknesses, they were able to do massive things. Remember even Samson. I like Samson, right? When Samson throws a tantrum, <laughs> you know, God's will is done. Remember? He just throws a tantrum and he's able to kill everyone because the Spirit of God comes to him. You could even, you know, like, whoa, what, what is happening there? But let's read this. The, the next preceding verses are very important. Let's read together this one. One, two, three, go. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. And this is basically what happened. Read this together because this is the now. This is the present condition of Christians. One, two, three, go. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. 
Some died by stoning. Some were sewed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed. Do you still want to be a Christian? Do you still want to follow Jesus? And this is the ultimate test of faith. Will you still believe in God if you suffer? This is, a, uh, this is a slide from Open Doors Ministry, you know, like a ministry for the persecuted church. And I don't, this is an old figure because I reckon today it's even higher, right? 322 Christians are killed for their faith. 214 churches and Christian properties are destroyed. 720, 772 forms of violence are committed against Christians. This is nothing. This is old statistics because now thousands Thousands of Christians are displaced from their own countries. Thousands are killed, you know? And these are not just, I mean, we only see the high-profile ones, like the priest who, like, got, you know, like, um, slashed, you know, like, uh, in the neck, and, you know, like, the European tragedies. But what's happening in Africa, what's happening in the Middle East, it's not really reported in the news. But thousands, thousands of Christians die. Thousands of Christians are persecuted. Now, do they keep their faith in Jesus? Maybe they did, right? And they have died martyrs. Now, let me ask you a question. If you suffer, if you are placed in these kinds of situations of hostility, will you still, will you still follow God? So these people, like in the time of Hebrews, they were too good for this world, wandering over the deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Isn't that what is happening to a lot of Christians all over the world right now? They end up as what? refugees, right? They end up as refugees, they run away from their country, they end up washing the beaches and stuff. Of course, this is very political, right? And there's like probably, oh, well, some of them are not really Christians, some of them, you know, like, I mean, regardless of whether they're Christians or not, they are being persecuted. They are being persecuted, and what do we do about it? Now, of course, we don't even think about our response yet, because let's, let's just think about us first. If we are put in a situation such as those, Will you still follow Jesus? You know? All these people earned a good reputation because their faith, because of their faith, yet none of them promised, uh, none of them received all that God has, has promised them. They just died following Jesus. They just died following Christ. So let's not talk about the promise of a, a Mercedes Benz or like a condominium or like prosperity or every, everything that is good. A lot of times you're given that. I don't want to say the word, you know. <laughs> You're given that. When, when, when you come to churches, you don't realize that actually Christianity is a lifelong process of what? Following God in suffering, right? We are a city, middle-class church. But you don't know what's happening out there. You know, I'm not saying that there's something wrong with us, but this is the reality, brothers and sisters. Believing in God can give you hope, can give you blessing, can give you joy in the presence of God, but believing of, in God is dangerous as well because it can make you suffer. Let's balance it out. Because I don't want you to come to me one day and say, you know what, Pastor John, I don't believe in God anymore. I don't want to follow God anymore. Why? Because I lost my job. Because I broke up with my girlfriend or my boyfriend. Or because I don't have a good relationship with my parents. You know, young people, are you following through, right? Whenever there is, we have a youth camp, I, I tell you this, okay, you're there in the youth camp, very confined space where you experience God and everyone's like crying, oh, I want to follow Jesus, I want to follow Jesus. And they're like, yeah, good on you, good on you, right? And what do I say? The first test of your faith is when you come home. When your mom or your dad picks you up from the camp, after staying there for three days, not sleeping on the final night, you know, because you need to have like some deep and meaningful talk and whatnot, la la la. <laughs> and then you come, okay, it's like, whoa, final rally, you know, like final, final challenge, you know, would you, are you willing to follow Jesus? And like, yes, I want to follow Jesus. This is the best camp ever, you know? And then what? There your mom is waiting at the car. Enter the car. Don't talk to me. There. It's like, hey, son, how are you? How, are you? how was the camp? Uh -huh, I'm tired. Uh -huh. That's it. That's it. 
a little bit of tiredness and discomfort and your faith is gone. <laughs> See? <laughs> That's why. And that's why, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm also for hype and whatever, but you test it, you know? And even for us here, you know, like Pastor John will preach to you and will give you like a big challenge, you know, like, come on, let's love one another. Then when you exit those doors, you know, you see your children. <gasps> you see your best friend. You're like, oh, you know, you see the people that you dislike. And it's gone. It's gone, completely gone. But of course, God is gracious. And my hope is, look at the life of the judges, <laughs> right? You know, if God is able <laughs> to give them much grace, He's able to give grace to each and every one of us. So that's my question. Are you able to follow God even when you're alone there? You know the story of the footprints in the sand? You know, you're with God. Are you, are you able to follow God when things get tough? So, as we wrap this up, brothers and sisters, Okay, did you make the connection now with the judges and Hebrews, right? They were commended for their faith, not because of their purity, not because of their moral integrity. They were commended for their faith because God transformed them, right? And I want that to stick in your mind and in your heart. The only thing that you can boast of in belonging to Central Baptist Church is because God is at work in you. I'm not a pastor who would like to tick the boxes and say, okay, you have fulfilled all of these righteousness, and therefore we give you a medal. If you want to earn a medal, go to Rio, right? You know? Maybe you can still <laughs> you know, catch the last flight and, and join the Olympics. We're not like that. Here in this community, everyone is welcome. Here in this community, we offer grace and love to everyone, regardless of your race, regardless of your language, regardless of where you are. We just want Jesus in your heart. And that will be my challenge again for the next six weeks as we partner together in Vision 2020. I've been here for one year, and I cannot do Vision 2020 by myself. It, it has to be our collective effort. Again, regardless of if you've been here for a week or a month, if God brought you to this church, you have a role to play for that Vision in 2020. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Yeah, even if you're traveling a lot, you know, like you're just here like every month, once a month, it's fine. You can do it. You can participate because we have God, and that's the most important thing. So Abraham had an obedient kind of faith. The second generations have that visionary faith, and Moses had that redeeming faith. The judges had an imperfect faith. To me, it's like a bit like, I, th I thought being imperfect and having an imperfect faith is better than having a perfect faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can someone claim to have a perfect faith, actually? Is it possible to have a perfect faith? Because you know what, this is just my take, okay? This is just my, my, my insight. I reckon if someone would say, I have a perfect faith, then you don't have faith anymore. Why? <laughs> because you have figured it out already. Remember, faith is what? An assurance of something that you don't see. It's surrendering to what is unknown. It's surrendering to the will of God. Are you following through? So I'm not saying that you become doubtful about your faith, but a little bit of wavering is sometimes necessary in order for you to cling on to God, right? A lot of times when you feel like you're perfect, you won't, you won't need God anymore. But we do need God every step of the way. Can I have an amen for that? Yes? Do you need God? <laughs> right? Do you need God? So this is it. This is, the, this is our journey, brothers and sisters. It's a broken kind of faith. And this is the stance that God wants us to have. Always humble, always recognizing, I, apart from you, I can do nothing. Apart from you, I can do nothing. That's why I shiver when, when I hear people call me Reverend. You know, like, hey, Reverend John. And I'm like, ooh. Because who needs to be revered anyway? Is it only God, right? God only deserves the reverence. 
Okay, I'm not, I'm not bashing the, <laughs> the religious system, right? But I think that's the discomfort of some of the other generations before, I mean, after me who are younger and who grew up in Australia, egalitarian and whatnot, you know, because, you know, like... And, 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 and some denominations don't stop at reverend. Some of them are like, the most reverend. It's like, whoa, the most reverend, you know. But God wants us to be broken. God wants us to revere Him with a broken heart, contrite heart, a humble heart. You know, a broken spirit and a contrite heart is what God requires from each and every one of us. As we wrap this up, this is the fi- these are the two final verses of our series. Let's read this together. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what has been promised since God has planned something better for us so that only together with... This is very powerful, okay? I'm not letting you go yet. I still have like what, probably five minutes to do this. <laughs> God has planned something better. So if we see the tapestry, remember, um, for those of you who are, you were not here, we were, we're doing this four picks, one story exercise. So these are the stories of uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and this is Moses. Whatever Prince is doing there, yeah. <laughs> you just ask those people. So this is like a tapestry of faith. This is a tapestry of the lives of those people, but these people were looking for something better. And according to the writer of Hebrews, that something better is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? They were looking for something better for us, and it's only fulfilled. It's only fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was like the look. So that's the connection there. Jesus is greater. Jesus is better. Right now, this one. I'm very excited with this one, okay? They, they had, God has planned something better for us. Um, for us, can, can we read that red part? One, two, three, go. So that only together with us will they be made perfect. I was like, what? No, we're talking about Old Testament heroes here. And, and the writer is talking about New Testament saints. And he's talking about you as well. It says here, so that only together with us they will be made perfect. What does that mean? You know, the processing and the hope that goes together in the belief of God from the very beginning up to the very end converges in the Lord Jesus Christ so that, brothers and sisters, we are part of the tapestry of faith in Christ. You are part of that story. See? Aren't you excited that the perfection of that faith, you are part of it. You are part of the narrative from the Old Testament down to the New Testament. Are you happy with it? Central Baptist Church is part of that because we are anchored in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. Like, think like sci-fi, Doctor Who mode. You know, like the past converging with the future, coming together in Jesus Christ. And that is the perfection of that faith. Are you excited? That means you have a role to play. You know, they have done their part. They have suffered. They have believed. They have been rejected. They have been persecuted. They died believing. And you need to continue on the story. You need to continue on the narrative because you're part of that. You know, it would be nice like if this church celebrates like 190 anniversary. In Singapore, we did this. You know, like in this... Everyone made like a piece of um, fabric and then they made this massive quilt, right? Maybe we can do that in the future, you know, like each one. So for example, the Brazilians will make like a, like a square, you know, like a, a flag of Brazil or something that's representative. Uh, maybe the young people will do like a, like a small piece of fabric, you know, with cup noodles as a, yeah, like as an icon, you know, like that kind of thing. And then maybe the German backpackers will have a backpack, you know, like. And then we sew it together. And then we form this massive, massive quilt or mass, massive um, tapestry, you know. And that is our story. That's our story of faith. So brothers and sisters, be encouraged. You could have been here in this church for a long time. You may have dropped this in, in this church for like about a week or you just visited. You are part of the narrative. You are part of our story. And this is what God is doing with to us because only together we would be made perfect in God.
Amen? Amen? Can you tell that to your seatmates before they all go to, to heaven at this <laughs> and say, you know what? You are part of the story. Can you say that? Yo, bro, yo, sis, you're part of the story. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Right? And for those of you who are from here, I, th- I see a lot of new faces, you know, especially in the middle. Please do reach out to them, even though they didn't raise their hands earlier, you know, like they didn't fill up the form because they are part of our journey. And if you guys are looking for a place to belong to, we're more than willing to, to embrace you and be part of this massive tapestry of faith. Amen? Shall we respond to that by singing a song that focuses, of course, in the life of Jesus Christ, even as we prepare ourselves to partake of the Lord's Supper um,